Catherine Lewin. I'm Director of the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity at University of Melbourne in Melbourne, Australia. And I'm also the IAS President and the AIDS 2024 International Co-Chair and co-chair the IAS Towards an HIV Cure initiative. I am an infectious disease physician and virologist and have been working on HIV latency since the late 90s. So this is really an exciting moment, but a moment to also say amidst the excitement, and as Christian mentioned today in his talk, close to 80 million people have lived with or are living with HIV. And although we have fantastic treatments, we still don't have a cure, and are far from a scalable cure. But the reason for the roundtable today is to learn from three of the seven people who have been cured of HIV infection, learn from their personal stories and experiences, which are so inspiring to all of us, not just to people living with HIV, but to the clinicians that care for people with HIV and the scientists working towards a cure, telling us that this is possible, and therefore we pour over the details of our three guests and the other four people described because we want to use every single detail of these cases to help us in the science to find a cure that will one day, we hope, be available to everyone living with HIV. So prior to the meeting starting on Sunday, we had a pre-conference. We actually do this every year before the IAS science meeting and the International AIDS Conference. And for the International AIDS Conference, we tailor these, these meetings very much towards the community so that the community is up to date with the latest science, the latest thinking. We can hear from the community about what they want to see in the HIV cure response and that we can also learn, in this case, um, from three very brave people who came along to our conference. I want to take a moment uh, to actually thank Jeff Taylor, who's up the back. Um, Jeff is an HIV activist from Palm Springs, and this was very much Jeff's vision and hope that we could bring together um, some of these people that have got extraordinary stories to tell. And he worked really hard at doing this, so I'm so glad that Jeff he is in the room hiding up the back, but now you've been exposed, Jeff. <laughs> um, I had the great pleasure of um, interviewing uh, our three guests today, uh, together with Jeff, on Sunday. And I um, noted then that it really felt like a momentous moment, just to have three of these people, who I'm going to introduce fully in a moment, uh, together in the one room. And today we have their doctors, one of their donors, and then of course um, the team that described the next Berlin patient that we heard in detail about uh, earlier today. And um, at the end of the session on Sunday, I think that um, Adam, Paul and Mark were sort of mobbed, basically. There were people up there, young scientists, activists, all wanting to have their photos taken with them. It was really wonderful to see. So with us on the panel, uh, we have Mark Frank, uh, previously known as the Dusseldorf patient, Paul Edmonds, previously known as the City of Hope patient, and Adam Castileo, previously known as the London patient. We also, amazingly enough, have their doctors who are respect respectively Bjorn, Jana, Ravi, and also remarkably Anya, who donated stem cells for Mark's treatment, which is really uh, very, very special. So we thank Anya for coming as well. And it is also incredible that of the seven, three of these seven uh, people are living in Germany. I don't know what that says about <laughs> German health care, German genes, I don't know, but there's German beer, I'm not sure, but there's something amazing I think that's... It's more DKMS. <laughs> the, the DK... The, the German database for trans. Oh, okay. We, well, we can hear more about that, but it, it, is, it is really extraordinary and also fantastic German science, of course. Um, and so none of it would be possible, of course, without Timothy Ray Brown. So I want to take a moment to pay tribute to Timothy. He was the first hmm. person cured of HIV. We learnt about Timothy's case in 2009. He was then known as the Berlin patient. But he bravely came out and really inspired um, many, many people, inspired the whole field, really, in saying that although 
cure is difficult, HIV integrates in the host genome. We know there's this long-lived reservoir. There are paths to eliminate it. At the same time, for a bit of history, and it's important to tell you, Francoise Barrow sinoussi the co-discoverer of HIV Nobel laureate, was the president of IAS. And back in 2010, she had the vision to make a, a commitment by the IAS, but also by the global scientific community, that this is an achievable goal and we must work towards a cure. And we've also got Steve Deek standing up the back, so I need to mention Steve because he's been an integral part of not only the HIV cure effort scientifically, but in much of what the IAS has done to accelerate, engage, um, engage community, engage industry, and engage all the scientists to achieve that goal. So today we um, had the incredible announcement of the next Berlin patient, and that's um, teaching us even more that we hadn't thought of before. We've got a very large panel, so I'm gonna jump straight into it. We have an hour, so there is no rush, but um, we'd like to people to keep, the people on the panel to keep their comments short so that we can have plenty of questions given that we've got so many people in the room um, currently. Um, are the doctors that, who have cared for each of the people with us um, are here to answer any questions. They won't speak at the beginning, but they're obviously here to help with any particular questions. So quick housekeeping. Uh, the round table, first of all, is in person only. So lucky you that you all made the effort to come to Munich. We know that many journalists prefer now to be virtual, but we like you to be in the room. You'll get better stories when you come, so please keep coming. Um, and uh, that uh, the information shared here today is all on the record, so it's important for our guests to know this as well, unless otherwise indicated by the speakers. After we've heard from each of our speakers, we'll open up the discussion for questions. Please, as usual, tell us your names and your media outlet and who you'd like to direct the question to. And with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Christian Gerbler, a group leader of translational immunology of viral infections at the Charité in Berlin. As you'll have heard, the case of the next Berlin patient delivered some new elements that we hadn't thought about before. I think Christian's got an interesting story because Christian was in New York training, I think, um, at a, a fabulous lab at Rockefeller University, my alma mater. And uh, at, while this was all happening in Germany, and then uh, Berlin was lucky enough to attract Christian back, who could do all the fancy science to uh, study the next Berlin patient. So Christian, um, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you're actually missing a part. I was in between Berlin and Rockefeller two times over the last 15 years, so. Oh, I okay. <laughs> but, uh, I need to hear more about that. <laughs> um, a, a lot of these um, have happened kind of while I was in between the places, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know how much I, s I, I have to repeat from my talk this morning. Um, I think we're incredibly lucky and, and privileged to present this case here uh, in Germany uh, on top of all things uh, and seeing um, this incredible, really, like, case of HIV remission for now um, what is such a long period of time in an individual who did not receive the homozygous Delta 32 um, transplant, which I think gives us a lot of um, questions to look into. Uh, and, and as Sharon mentioned it, I'm, I'm also someone who very in-depth studied the HIV reservoir. And I think now seeing that we kind of have a, um, a case at least where this resistance mutation was not fully present, but yet we still do see this HIV remission. So basically, the hypothesis there is really that we had this biologically meaningful reduction impact on this HIV reservoir. I think one could see a glass half empty, glass half full. I, I would rather see a glass half full because it really shows us that in this case, this, this big, big obstacle that everyone who's working on the HIV reservoir appreciates, I think we really can see that it worked out to make an impact on this and see this long-term remission. And this really gives me hope that when we study this more in depth, when we learn and really understand more, that we can translate this into, into something that is broader and more Great, thank you, Christian. Our next speaker is Samad Kaur. Samad is the oncologist who looked after and looks after the next Berlin patient. And while the next Berlin patient has chosen to remain anonymous for now, uh, we thought it would be really interesting to hear from Samad who can share some first-hand experiences of his treatment and also perhaps the beginnings of how you made it all happen. 
Thank you very much for being here today. I really appreciate it. It's a great opportunity. And um, the phrase I heard today and yesterday um, several times was putting people first. And um, I think this is um, really great because I want to put the patient first in this field. I mean, for me, he's a real hero of all of this because actually he did not only survive AML, the treatment, the transplant, he fought back to life, but he was the one who approached repeatedly different medical professionals and uh, in, re in regard of possible cure. And uh, he was turned down several times. Mm. And um, <clears throat> eventually, I was really lucky that um, his request was forwarded to me. So um, in the beginning, I wasn't really sure. And I wasn't really, um, I didn't realize how special this is. But um, over the time, I had to delve in this new subject for me, HIV in the scientific context. And I learned so much, and uh, I had the great opportunity and experience to work with dedicated scientists like Christian Gebler, Christina Allers, and many more. And um, yes, I think that um, without his effort, we wouldn't have this, this case today. Great, thank you. I'm sure people will have other questions about that for you. Our next speaker is Mark Frank, as I mentioned earlier, also known as the Dusseldorf patient. And um, Mark uh, will also share with us some of his personal reflections on how living without HIV and now without cancer has impacted his life. Mark. Well, my, name is, my name is Mark Frank. I'm the Dusseldorf patient. I hope you knew most of my story. Uh, 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 fact is that I'm transplanted in 2013 uh, with a homicide diagnosis, CCR5 delta 32 delta 32. Um, so I'm the, from all cured, I'm the longest living person after the transplant. Um, my case was uh, looked after uh, by Björn and two work for worldwide at ICSPAM. And so I was happy to run into Christian this morning when I entered the conference to ask him to join uh, IC STEM and yeah, he said yes. And <laughs> I, that's a good thing because they collect all the data from all of the transplanted people. And I hope that this new case with the uh, heterocycle, heterocycle is, uh, being uh, a, tr a transplant uh, will, they will bring a new puzzle piece to all the puzzles we collected together. And in my case, uh, it's, uh, my, um, it's special because I knew my stem cell donor, Anna Espeting, beside, and I'm very happy to have her. She's like a sister to me. I'm 55, I'm single child, and in my age, you get new <laughs> sisters and brothers. It's amazing. <laughs> and I'm happy to have a new brother. And, and then at the um, um, session in the morning, I ran into Samud, and uh, we made a selfie, and he will send it to his, <laughs> his patient. And I hope that we can get in touch anonymously, and then we can talk about our cases and that's for me this uh, day was uh, special. Great, thanks Mark. Just for, to fill in a little bit, IC STEM is a European network of people with HIV who've received bone marrow transplants. Ravi is part of it. He might add a little bit more about IC STEM. Um, and they recently published a, a, a detailed analysis of 30 recipients of transplantation published in Lancet HIV, that will give you a little bit more detail because from case reports, we can make some assumptions that once we get bigger numbers, you can start seeing some different trends and that case study tells us a little bit that maybe we might have even predicted result in the next Berlin patient, but maybe Ravi will, will talk about that when we get to him. Um, so next to Mark uh, is Mark's physician, Bjorn. Congratulations, Bjorn, and welcome. Um, and then we'll now hear from 
Anna Pras. Anna is the stem cell donor in Mark's case, or as Mark's sister, as you've heard already. <laughs> and uh, Anna will tell you a little bit about her experience. Oh, let's go. Okay. <laughs> we're going to leave the doctors to okay. people. We're putting people first, not doctors. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Anna. Um, and just to clarify that Anna is obviously CCR5 negative and therefore resistant to yeah. HIV. Most strains of HIV use CCR5, but not all strains, but we know that people that carry this mutation are resistant to HIV. Um, and I think, talking of hope, we have uh, uh, Paul Edmonds, who was also known as the City of Hope patient, and Paul's going to tell us a bit about his story. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, really beautifully said, thank you. Next to Paul is Jana. Uh, uh, welcome, Jana. And then next to Jana is a, what, who I might call the big brother. That's Adam <laughs> Castileo, also known as the London patient. And Adam uh, was, played a very important role as the second person we knew of 
who had been cured, because at the beginning people thought maybe Timothy Brown was some freak of nature and we'd never see this again. So Adam was the second and very important person that came out a, lot, a while ago now. But Adam, over to you. Yeah, um, I'm Justin Viejo, the second person to be cured by Timothy. I was diagnosed in 2003. Um, at the time, I thought I would have a, a, a death sentence, and I realized it was a life sentence. Um, but then I had a wonderful opportunity in 2016 to have a transplant that I'm able to say um, I've been diagnosed in 2003 and cured in 2016. So many, not many people can say that, and I think I want more people in the world to have that opportunity too. Um, in my case, um, as well, I have my, my donor is from Germany, so <laughs> the theme continues. Uh, the theme. <laughs> um, now, um, like Mark said, we are on the ISIS 10 list. Um, I'm number 36. Mark is number 19 on the list. Um, we want more people to be part of, of that list because it's important to have more collaborations worldwide. Um, in my case, being um, for myself as a global ambassador for HIV, I, I, I want people to have hope. I want people to feel the, the need that it's possible. And I want to do that. And I want to bring diversity to the table because it's important to have that. Um, we live in a diverse world and I think I bring that spectrum into that. And I, I want to do that. Um, be part of this select group. We want to be have more people part of this group. We want more people, and we only have we are only seven right now, and we have only one female, the New York patient. But we want more female representation in this group. It's important because we want to give hope to all female populations around the world. They are living with HIV right now, and it's important to have that. B B is important to make the New York patient here. That is a hope for all the females living with HIV around the world. In my case, um, it's important to remind that it's a teamwork between doctors and patients, and that is we have, that's been our, my, the Professor Arinda Gupta and I, we working um, to give that hope, to give diversity, as I said before, and to give that, that different spectrum to the HIV. Great, thanks Adam. And, and, and sitting next to Adam is Ravi, as I mentioned earlier, who's flown across from um, London today. So I think um, you'll all agree these are incredible stories, um, something that none of us ever imagined and um, are hearing about it now. Um, happy to take your questions. It, once again, reminder, please tell us your names, your media outlet, and who you'd like to direct your question to. Um, if you could keep your questions brief, that'd be great because we've got a lot of people here and we want to give everyone an opportunity to ask any questions. After we finish at four, you'll have an opportunity to speak one-on-one -on -one with any of um, three men here and their doctors and or uh, Christian as well. So let's begin. Who would like to start? Yes. First of all, we need to we need to always focus on why why is um, why we what is this hematological disease or some call of hematological disease whatever, and we need to first address that. So our first goal is always to cure the patient of this um, leukemia, his lymphoma, whatever, and. Um, Additionally, I think it's important to work with, um, that it's a team effort and we need to work together with scientists who are familiar in the infectious disease field. And um, so it has to go hand in hand and I think this is the right approach. If I go to follow up on that, so the next Berlin patient wanted to stop antiviral therapy. His doctors were saying no, is that what was happening? Just if you could talk a little bit yeah. about that. Well, I think um, before I start answering this question, I need to put uh, give some more background. Okay. Because um, Christian um, displayed it today that 
he was diagnosed in 2000 of 2009, um, and during this first period, during the first six years, he was living with HIV, but he, he wasn't treated because it, back then we had different guidelines and mm -hmm. it wasn't necessary because the CD4 um, cell counts were high enough and he didn't have any major mm -hmm. other problems. And um, for, so for this reason, the patient um, had already, I think, a different mindset from the beginning on. And um, in April of 2015, um, when his blood counts fell and also the AML diagnosis um, when the AML manifested, um, he started, it was the first time he started uh, his antiviral therapy. And um, so the, he continued, he, he had to deal with the AML treatment and he went through the transplantation and afterwards um, he was, um, we were looking for um, CCR5 um, homozygous um, mutated donor, but we couldn't find anyone. So we decided, okay, we have the chance. Actually, um, I need to be, um, yeah, I need to be aware what I can say and what I cannot say when I ask the patient, so mm -hmm. I think it's okay. We had um, also the possibility, he had a brother, or he has a brother, and his brother was um, HLA identical. So normally would you choose his brother, but um, since his brother didn't have any mutations concerning CCR5, we were looking, we kept looking for a different donor, and we found one, it was heterocytous. So that was the reason why we decided to um, choose this person as a donor. He was a female donor. And um, yeah, and fortunately everything went just pretty well. He, he, um, he achieved long-term remission concerning his AML. That, and afterwards, um, I think this is why I said before that it's important to, um, to get in touch with people who are working with HIV and I think um, we, since we are hematologists, mm -hmm. we know you know we have some information, we have we know we have some knowledge, but we don't have it to an extent as we need to. And um, afterwards, the patient he stayed and stayed on uh, AR um, on antiviral treatment for three years, and um, he was only been um, he visited only his outpatient clinic physician. And the patient said, okay, well, I didn't need the antiviral therapy before. Now I don't have AML. My blood counts are fine. Why would I need the antiviral treatment now? And, um, but, well, the physicians, they weren't sure what to do. And they said it's, it would be, it's better, it's safe if you just continue. But the patient, well, he displayed remarkable courage and mm. he, decided he chose for himself to start the treatment. Yes. Yeah, hello, I'm Anuradha from the Indian Express. I'm from India. Uh, my question is not scientific. I want to ask Adam and Mark. Of course, a lot has been written about yours, but did you ever lose hope? Did you, in this journey, uh, you know, what was your personal feeling? I mean, it's a long process, and still stem cells to it's it still moved right so what were your feelings for me personally uh it would be with first of all you know i was you know i want to survive that was first first of all to a uh, cancer patient that's important to keep in mind and, um, but for me it's a responsibility to science because i was given the opportunity to be the second person to be curation in the world so by the for my time and for science so that responsibility was he was given to me and put on me, and but we work as a team, and it was kind of a team effort on that. But it was yeah, responsibility to science and human science. So in my case, but it's just personal because I felt like, wow, if I can give that, you know, one could be hope. Because yeah, but what about your quality of life? My quality of life before that, before before or after you asked me. Both. Both. I think before, you know, as a cancer patient, it was really difficult. Now my quality of life as a transplantee, as a survivor, 
has improved, but it's important for people to know that challenges, um, each individual challenges of each patient have individual um, consequences and conditions that develop after transplant. But in my case, I improved. My health I improved since the transplant. So doctor, they would be on immunosuppressant drugs strong. I mean, it depends really on, on, on the specifics of the case because uh, directly after the transplantation, most patients are in immunosuppressive drugs for some time, some right. for months, some for years. Um, and obviously in this, this time, they, they are more susceptible for opportunistic infections, similar right. to some, even some of the same infections which we know from AIDS. Uh, but there are also some other problems because otherwise there's a risk of, of graft or host disease so that, that the new immune system attacks actually parts of the, yeah, the recipient's body. Um, but it really depends on how good was the match, so whether the donor was perfectly matched or not so good, and whether any signs of CD, CDHD arise or not. Does it, Jana Victor actually is the expert on that. <laughs> yes. Well, um, so some of the patients um, ha did develop uh, graft versus host disease, and it's thought that that may be uh, important in terms of um, a graft versus HIV effect um, as, a, as a, a, a potential for impacting the, the cure for HIV um, and uh, impacting the reservoir. But of course, um, some of the people didn't develop um, graft versus host disease. I know that the New York patient, I believe, um, did not. And so um, it seems rather variable as to what the course has been. But um, as uh, Bjorn indicated, there is um, a risk of um, being on immunosuppressants for a prolonged period of time, which does put you at risk for various opportunities of infection. Thank you. We have a question over here. Hi, thank you. Uh, more for the woman AIDS man. As a community <laughs> HIV journalist, we're very often trying to explain that this is, the, how difficult the procedure is. Uh, I think we often use euphemisms when we talk about the quote, grueling treatment and it's too risky in other circumstances. I think Adam's touched on it. Maybe I'd like to hear from, from Mark and Paul about just the experience. Just, I think sometimes we might help some of us communicate further to the wider community about what's involved mm -hmm. in, in going through these procedures. Well, if you see me now, you think everything is okay, but it's not okay. I have graft versus host, I have dry eyes and that's hurting me a lot. After several years of searching, now I find a thing that's working. I've got scleral lenses, these are hard lenses filled with nacre. Uh, so, yeah. What's the still solution? Um, this is working, and because of the chemos, I have fatigue, and if you have fatigue, then you can't look well and you work on a computer, it's not a good combination. And uh, people can't think what we went through because you see all only the patients who did it. If you look at the ISISTEN database, I'm number 19, Adam is number 36, the Genevian patient is number 34, so there are numbers missing. And uh, you have to think about uh, the people who didn't make it. And I got, I uh, gave my life to uh, the, uh, tr the treatment for several years. For example, uh, after the stem cell transplant, I was out of work for three and a half years. And this is a really hard time, and a hard time where you have to protect yourself. Uh, the little germ can kill you. And at that time, masks were not so used, and I was the alien in my city uh, when I was shopping. And uh, you, you can't plan your life because from one day to the other, everything can change. And so I'm very glad that now I have my life uh, back. And in my case, uh, the power of love 
uh, guided me through all this because I learned about my, by my husband in the first week in hospital. And he then uh, visited me and she then he visited me every day. And uh, the doctors looked at me and well, he has, uh, why does he look so fine? But I have to be glad for the evening. <laughs> <laughs> um, Paul, do you want to talk about your, I think, I think the question's about like that period when you are really sick with a trans, generally with a transplant. Maybe talk through that period. Yeah, I, you know, I, I felt like I was, uh, because of having had HIV for a little over 30 years, the kind of prepared me, uh, you know, for dealing with uh, uh, critical diagnosis. Uh, and uh, I, I was thinking about what came over to me like, and it actually gave me a pleasant effect. I started my chemo the, uh, the last chemo. Yes, please. Um, Liz Hollyman from Paws Magazine. Um, I got to know Timothy Brown. He lived in San Francisco. I remember he was always getting poked and prodded and his blood tested and his bi biopsy pretty much for his entire rest of his life. I'm wondering if you are all three continuing to go through that process of getting tested in various ways to see if HIV might be working somewhere. In my case, I regularly check the leukemia report lately. Sometimes we are extending now for a few months period to but uh, for the last five years we've been constant monitoring every four to eight weeks checking okay. viral loads and see for cancer and see if there is no presence. Yeah. Adam uh, any any cancer. tissue biopsies? Yeah. It's just yeah. blood now. Yeah, just blood, maybe, maybe you want to explain that Ravi? We we did do tissue biopsies and um there's there's good amount of brain um, in in a couple of years after the transplant. But more recently we uh, we we did continue that because at the time we found fragments of HIV um, sequence in, in those um, tissues, but we didn't find any evidence that there was a whole virus lurking there um, in multiple different samples. So um, I think in the interest of Adam's quality of life, we we decided we weren't going to continue sampling, and I think I think that was the right decision. Paul, Mark, any yeah, comments? For, for me, uh, in, the, in the beginning, uh, uh, we hope to. Uh, we started with twice a week, then once a week, then every two weeks, then every month. Now we are at two months. I gave tissues from my breast too, and uh, they took a lymph node to shake the, the red, red around the field. And Christian, what's your plan with the next orientation? I think very similar. Um, so um, sampling right now is between two to three months, and there were also tissue biopsies involved in a regular checkup and a colonoscopy and upper uh, GI endoscopy. I think we had a question here. Yes. Yeah, I'm Wright Ferrazzi. I'm a media scholar, HIV advocate, and I also work with Plus Life. So thank you to IA IAS for bringing me into the room. Um, my question is probably for the investigators. Is there a universally accepted standard for a timeline of being able to distinguish between, say, delayed viral rebound or prolonged viral um, suppression after ARC? versus someone who is conclusively cured? I might get Christian to answer that one. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're the youngest um, member amongst <laughs> us, the up and coming rising star, Christian. I, I don't believe we have a good answer, to be honest. And I've been asked, like, can, do you, can you say that this is a cure? And, and probably I've said HIV cure many times, probably in my talk today, but I think we should probably always leave it in with potential cure. Um, maybe in our case, even a bit, the potential should be even maybe more pronounced because we don't have a CCR5 delta 32 homozygous -like background. So I think we do have these functional co-receptors and seeing that we have over five years of remission now is really extremely remarkable when you compare it also to other cases we've seen in the past. 
Um, but again, I think it goes back to someone who works on this HIV reservoir, who has worked on this virus for quite some time now. It, in the end, it could take really one replication competent virus. And we are sampling some peripheral blood and we're trying to do the, the, what could be acceptable for the quality of life of our, um, of our individuals that we're studying. But it's, it's, it's not that easy, right? Because we cannot make a, a real good answer about tissue reservoirs. And we cannot be 100% sure if there's not somewhere a reservoir that we're not um, really having, that we're not able to measure. So I think the, 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 the best out or the, the best real answer that we have is in treatment interruption measuring viral loads and not seeing viral reactivation at this stage. I think this is really the hard clinical endpoint that we can say. To really say 100% cure, we have to follow for the lifetime of the individual. And if we don't see viral rebound, we can say that. But until then, I don't think we can say it with 100% certainty. So potentially should be the right answer. When we, do we have a cutoff when to say remission, when to say cure? I don't think so. It's not a, it's not a yes or no answer, but and being really um, careful, monitoring, and, and maybe saying potentially it should be cured, that's probably the right language to use. So Martin, I'll just get you to respond to that with respect to when you tell someone if they're cured of leukemia, because when we spoke to Paul, Adam, and Mark, and well, uh, on Sunday, and I asked what they worry more about when they visit their doctor, the leukemia coming back or the HIV, they all said the leukemia. So what do you say to <laughs> the next villain patient about cure of his leukemia? Well, I think that um, not only for this person, this patient, but just in general, I think we have some different time points, like especially the first two years after transplantation, these years are for us really critical. And afterwards, I, well, I read some statistic that 90% of the rebounds, um, the relapses of AML occur during this period. And afterwards, um, until year five, I think there, there are still just a really rare cases when it even happens after five years, but afterwards it's really, really um, rare that uh, the relapse happens, but it does. I mean, Ruth Brown is a mm. really famous um, example for that. Yeah. I think, yes? I had a pretty much a similar, uh, the same question that I, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm Yu Miyashi, I'm a practitioner in the Japanese uh, media. And uh, yeah, I had a pretty much the same question for the doctor, like, how do you define that the patient is cured? But also, I also have a question for the patient that when you're told that you're cured, and then what was your reaction? And um, if you remember, you know, I guess you remember the moment, or I don't know how you were told, but uh, yeah, I was curious. No. Well, uh, this wasn't such a, such a moment. You're, uh, <laughs> when you're talking about cure, uh, uh, Björn uh, was very anxious to have this word in his mouth. And, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, I, I really thought about being cured when the article in Nature Medicine was published, and that was the point for me to have my second coming out and to tell I'm the whistleblower patient before, uh, yeah. I mean, we were, we were really, really reluctant in, in discussing cure, remission, and so on. And it was a process of, it was this, not, I was going to Mark and saying, say, now you're cured, or something mm -hmm. like that. <laughs> so um, it was a process of, of, let's say, many years, probably over three to four years, where we were discussing where we stand, what type of, of reservoir examinations we still plan in, in the I system consortium, and so on. Because actually we were working on this until we decided to do the ATI. This was a process of six years after the transplantation, where we did all the cutting edge technologies. And, and when we were finished doing them, there were new cutting edge technologies. <laughs> so we're doing these and so on and so on. So, so then there were, this, as, as, as um, discussed before, the reservoir examinations is very difficult. They're, they're technically very challenging. And you get there's a risk of false positives, then you have positive results which probably reflect um, detected viruses and the functional assays where you really could detect functioning virus, they're not that sensitive, mm -hmm. you can't examine every cell, 
and then you had some trace results here, and then negative results, and some trace results which are not really positive, but also not really negative. So, so really, really deciding what to do was very difficult, and we were discussing it all the time, and at some point we did basically everything we could think of, and then the only way to prove your remission, whatever you would call it, was the ATI, and then, um, then the pandemia came, and, and time was, and, and then, that were basically four years were, were gone. Um, so, and then we said after four years, especially since we didn't find um, intact virus or replicating virus uh, in, in all the assays and it didn't come back after four years. And then we knew before transfer, we basically only had our five tropic viruses and there's no, no target cells left in the immune system we were really sure that we can talk about cure, since we basically have the second layer of defense. Even if there would be one intact virus left, it wouldn't find mm. cells to infect. Uh, and so we felt safe to call it cure at that point, but Christian is totally right. It's, it's difficult to define since you couldn't examine every cell, and it's easy to prove if you find something, but you can't prove that there is nothing. Mm. So that's, that's the thing. Paul and Jana, your story. And it's not, it's not out of one single point and tell you you cure. You were saying it takes time, it takes years for you to actually kind of accept together you are cured. It doesn't happen. It takes it takes years, so you explain. So you never because everybody asks you, you want to tell you you cure. You never have specific time for that. It's just a process you go through and then we finalize and say, I think we believe you are cured. But it takes time. It's just we all together go in the same journey um, to to get there. Oh, sorry. I just I just we just have one last question from Paul Yana, and then we'll go to oh, you. Yeah. No, I I I to be honest, it, it's hasn't been easy for me to accept it because of, for almost half of my life I've lived with HIV. So yeah. you know, it's still I kind of think my sense that it's it's real, but I do. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, we're, we're thrilled that actually Paul did hit the five-year mark of um, transplant. Uh, we, um, from February of this year, 2024, was the five-year anniversary from his transplant. And we also did um, reservoir testing, which, um, again, is, you know, it, it's, it's certainly um, um, positive when, it's po when there's no evidence of replicated virus, but, of course, it doesn't excuse the possibility that it couldn't potentially come back, but we're happy to say that to date there has been no evidence of um, replicating HIV in Paul, and also I would say that, you know, I still email him and <laughs> message him about his labs just because I think you, you still want to hear it, you know, oh yes, you're still undetectable, your bubble is still undetectable while remaining off antiretroviral therapy. Yes, you had a question. Yes. Uh, Could we int introduce yourself, please? My name is Shona. I might just get Ravi to maybe tap it out. Maybe that's a question of a little bit of debate, I mean, uh, and uh, an evolution really, in terms of how long you have to be negative after these types of treatments. Um, when we first described um, Abel's case uh, in Nature, it was 18 months. And um, after the review process, we were asked to use the word remission, uh, and some of the uh, reviewers may be in the room. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think that was exactly in retrospect that was that was correct. I think that eighteen months is fairly early, but it's still longer than any you know than, 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 than you said we found to happen within within the first year really based on um, sort of previous data. So, um, but actually to be sure, we we kind of came together and we published the, the paper in the Lancet HIV on thirty six months I think, which is three years. And I think you know maybe that we you know it's under debate really at the moment. Uh, and I think one thing we should be doing is writing consensus statements and coming to 
together to, to sort of say how long after ATI and RDNA can be called impure. Because I think we're kind of getting more and more data now. And, and I think one of the big outputs of, of the proof of people who are cured is that we can start talking about the time frame. And you can back it up with mathematical modeling to some extent as well. So I, I think that's a, a great question. Other questions in the room? Yes, go ahead. Oh, Brian, I don't think got any others. Plus line. Um, so I have a question. I'm not totally clear on it. Um, so is there any risk of um, chronic inflammation still if there's any latent reservoir left in the body? Comorbidities associated with that? Christian, do you want to? I mean, at this point, I would say because we have really these meaningful patients and with the techniques that we're using, we can't detect it. I, I would also, we don't need antiretroviral therapy, so at this mm -hmm. point, when we think of really the effects of viral reservoirs or maybe underlying chronic in inflammation, I wouldn't say so, no. But actually, after the transplant, you see changes in the, the pattern of CD8 or CD4 and stuff like that. But this is due to the bone marrow transplant. So there's more immune activation, but this is due to the, to the methodological part, um, actually, of the story. This has nothing to do with the latent reservoir. Yeah, yes. Sorry, oh, sorry. Is I mean, it would be but difficult to see the part the effects of replication from having had a transplant. I think I'll have to So, good question. Good question. Can you use information? Maybe we'll start, Christian, with your view that you might have talked about. Yes, and we'll I think it's a that. little speculative, right? But I mean, we also learned that maybe being German helps. It was really when talk, it, it's really, I think, looking at these kind of now having more cases, right? And really trying to see, I mean, that's all, what we always do, right? We're trying to see patterns. And I mean, and then we, we probably go down one lane and then maybe sometimes something changes and we, we, we put our focus somewhere else. And I think now, like, in our case, I would say what's really striking to me is kind of maybe going away a little bit from the, the resistance aspect, which again, I think is extremely important. And we see it as a pattern because we see the majority of cases within this Delta 32 background. But maybe then, like, thinking a bit more about, again, like the reservoir aspect and these depletions, that maybe having sex differences in an allogenic immune system coming in might play a role. So I'm, I'm, I'm really speculating here. I don't really have good data to back this up. Maybe um, some, some more stem cell transplantation researchers might have like some aspects in that. But also like these questions of underlying CCR5 heterozygosity. And although we looked at reservoir, kind of again with our techniques that we're trying to apply, looked at maybe quantitative um, um, evaluations of reservoir within maybe individuals with the CCR5 heterozygous status and not. And they're having better tools now, maybe looking at more qualitative differences might, might be interesting too. And I think it's a little bit curious that Timothy Brown was heterozygous, the next Berlin patient was heterozygous. And I, I think looking at this might be very, very helpful. Do you want some? Yeah, perhaps. I, I, I actually think it may have some effect on the graph of this reservoir graph of HIV, because as I understood, the dermatologist involved in Mark's case, Ido Kobe, um, there's a slightly higher risk of graft as opposed to disease if you have a female donor, uh, because uh, especially females, when they had pregnancies before, because well, the, the child is something that can be basically, um, well, uh, the immune system remembers that they saw something different, which is the child with, with the gene from the father. This can actually make the risk somewhat higher, not very high, but somewhat higher for graft as opposed to disease. Whether this has something to do with Graft versus HIV is totally unclear. But normally they try to choose not the female donors. But in these cases, they were just the ones who had the fitting patterns and the homozygous or heterozygous uh, CR5 mutation. Maybe I can yes. also add yes. something. Um, I think yeah, thank you both for, for the input. And uh, well, I, don't, I cannot give you any numbers, but I actually I recently talked to a person who's working for um, the KMS. And she told me that uh, 
but at least in Germany there are more potential female donors. Mm. So I think this might be a reason why uh, we, we have seen more okay. female donors because there are more females who are willing to get registered or to do that. Jan, any theories on the male-female issue? Yeah, well, uh, so Paul Turner was male, so um, it's not all uh, yes. female. But I think also there's other um, potential areas to explore in terms of um, innate immunologic reasons that someone might um, have, a, have a better response in terms of surgery HIV after a transplant, um, you know, meaning specifically certain HLA typing um, has been associated with um, improved uh, um, HIV resistance. So it's, it's so I think there's other aspects that should be explored as well. Ravi, anything else? <laughs> oh, yes, so I You said also the Geneva patient was also was a wild card, wild card patient. I think this was also discussed that the HLA and the K cells sometimes may not play a role together with some drugs he does for his DHC, the Rosalutinib, and so on. So I think this is this is why we have to, to, to get more information, get all these cases together to really try to sort out what, what was the important part. Yeah, it might be important to note there are some animal models now that we can explore this and that's maybe a, 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 a more controlled system rather than case reports. Yes? And then I see the photos of males also. Can I go? Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask about HIV prevention because I think all of you have been living with HIV for quite some time and I just got used, used to that and prevention is no longer a concern in the same way. Um, I just wonder how it's been living with that on your two questions. Personally, in my case, I've been cured HIV. Now I'm more part of the community than ever before. Um, and for me, I don't only want to work in the HIV spaces to support patients. I want to work in the treatment spaces and prevention. It's prevention, treatment, and cure. That's what I personally, in my case, I go with my for HIV. That's what I want to focus myself in the three spaces because. We see a lot of things to do in prevention. We still need to work a lot in treatment, but it's the same thing. I want to be part of the cure because I'm part of the cure. So, but I want to be in all four spaces, in the three spaces in HIV. I'm just going to mean, you know, because I'm HIV and HIV and man, but I have to think about HIV prevention for myself. I'm just guessing oh, okay. you're in a new place. Yeah, it's a, it's a different perspective to be, but you have to take it, it's a person individually, the way you you deal with prevention. I don't know if that was in privately for anyone, but I think <coughs> PrEP and prevention is always the best way. So I, for, for me, I, I've been in a long-term relationship for over 32 years. Uh, my client is uh, undetectable, and once he has HIV, one, I'm not going to say that. And then, uh, I think it's kind of a risk to try to know No? Any comments? No. <laughs> I'm uh, happy to be cured, and I hope that my my case and the others and the tissues I did did bring the cure for everyone. And I'm now fighting against HIV stigma and to learn that people first is uh, very important, and I hope that all the journalists use the word right. I just had it on Monday in German television. I was announced as a cured AIDS patient, and I got mad. Yes, and I right, hope please. that you won't use the word AIDS yes. in combination with a person anymore. And I talked to Sharon right. about changing the word of the conference because if now AIDS is in <coughs> or everyone's mouth and we have the people, uh, if they hear the word AIDS, they have the pictures from the 80s and I want to get rid of it. Uh, and in German television, uh, on there was a, a story about uh, the conference and they had a patient and he told I'm living with HIV, and then his doctor told, I don't care, I'm 
not um, uh, at the, it's not at the um, handling the patients is easy, but I uh, uh, but dealing uh, what the people uh, what the patients have to deal with their uh, the people around them is more important than being uh, being. Uh, um, yeah, I'm good. Treated. Treated. Uh, uh, she, she said, I don't, uh, it's easy to treat the people, but uh, she is anxious about how the people are treated from, the, uh, from others. Yeah, and excellent. That's the key point. And it took me uh, 10 years to think about will I go out with my story? And this is. Uh, one of the things are because you don't know what the media make of it. And I hope that all of you read the Carta from the IRS page and that you think about it. And that's really important yes. to get rid of the HIV stigma. Thank you, Mark. It's very Thank well you. said. Yes. Um, language matters. Yes. We even heard Olaf Schultz on the opening <coughs> ceremony talking about language matters. And um, the media are the what you know the voice of language and uh, have got huge audiences so help us in getting that out i just make one comment about prep because the setting of a ccr5 negative bone marrow chance of infection by a non-ccr5 using glass is extremely small i think the bigger issues with christian's patient and whether prep might be what, what we might advise in that situation yeah we've talked about this right in patient is very aware of this it's been communicated yeah yeah it's a, it's a tough issue i think we're at time thank you very much i'd like to make a special thank you to adam paul and mark for um your courage in coming and joining us at the hiv conference um and also